All this fits into our problem of the evening, which is a very difficult and abstract one at best. And that is this ageless quest for value. What is value? It is hard to define it because, actually, value for man arises in man. Value for man must be in terms of his own experience, or in the experience of his own kind. Value must be meaning for him. If he was a different type of being, with a different equipment of mind and emotion, his standard of value would have to be different. But because he regards that to be valuable, which satisfies his instinct of value, Our first problem, of course, is to try to understand his instinct. For it is in this way only that we can come to something which can never be approached, uh, we might say, dogmatically. Value can never be always the same for all people. Yet we do observe one thing, and that is that certain value has a tendency to gradually take over in the admiration of peoples. That which is good usually comes to be recognized as good, but this often takes quite a long time, especially if the creator of the objects is in advance of his own day or has a vision beyond the horizon of his contemporaries. We can take, for example, the problem of a painter who is doing a landscape Perhaps this is a painter who lived long ago, during the Sun or Ming dynasties in China. His landscape consists of a mountain, a tree, a waterfall, and a house. Now, actually, these elements are not unique or especially rare in art. But we can say to ourselves, where on this piece of silk should these objects be? Here is a large piece of silk with quite a design on it perhaps a mountain and a valley, where should the house be? The artist, the great artist, can only answer that the house must be where it has to be. Somewhere in that painting there is the place, and the only place, where that house is exactly right. It is only the intuitive skill of the artist that can determine that precise place. If he is an amateur, he will not be correct, and those who come after him will know that he is an amateur. If his judgment is not sound, he will be mistaken in some way. Some value of his picture will not be valuable. Therefore, when we see a great painting, when maybe centuries later this picture of the landscape is hung in one of our great galleries, we say to ourselves, is it not remarkable that this house is exactly where it ought to be. We have the mysterious intuitive power of sensing this rightness. We could not have put it there ourselves. We are not perhaps the great artist. But we recognize that it is where it belongs. Therefore the picture becomes acceptable to us. And because it is acceptable to many, it becomes rare. And becomes it, because it becomes rare, it becomes expensive. And in the long run, we buy as art that which has a certain rightness about it. Therefore, one way of approaching the concept of value is to say that value is the rightness of things. Whatever this rightness may be, or whatever department of life we may be considering. The person who is right has certain values. The idea that is right has certain continuance and acceptance. The policy that is right is respected, even by persons who could never have framed it, and who could never perhaps see uh, or maintain that policy in action. So one thing in our quest for value that we intuitively seek is rightness. Rightness is that which satisfies some instinct, some intuition 
within ourselves. And how does the average person achieve this sense of rightness? One great collector of Oriental porcelain said that there is only a single path composed of two procedures by which rightness can be determined. One is comparison, and the other is intuition. By comparison, we perceive relative degrees of rightness. By intuition, we go beyond this and sense pure value. So wherever we are looking for that which is better, or we look by means of comparison, we see things that are not as good. And in this pattern, betterness stands out by comparison. Also, if the object is something with which we are unfamiliar, or by which no comparison can fortunately be made, then we must depend upon our own ability to intuit value. What enables us to intuit value? And out of this thought must come the realization that this intuitive power must result from a certain continuing experience. Uh, we have to have within ourselves certain knowledge, certain information, a certain body of fact, if we are to determine value. Value cannot be decided from our ignorance. It must be decided from certain strength of knowing. And this strength of knowing, the Greeks gave much consideration to. Perhaps among the Platonists, Neoplatonists, we had some of the earliest efforts to determine and define value. And their concept was not essentially different from that of the Asiatic. Namely, that value arises in the taste or comprehension of the person who is seeking value. And unless there is a certain degree of value in him, he cannot determine value in anything else. Consequently, we must become educated in the concept of value. We cannot find that which we have no equipment to estimate. We might accidentally hit upon something valuable occasionally, but even then it is not certain that we would not trade it for something of less value unless our own taste protected our decision. So things which are valuable ultimately come into the possession of those who know value, simply because other persons are not able to hold them. They are not able to recognize that it is important to hold on to that which they do not understand. Now, we use this level of interpretation simply because it has a bearing upon the entire psychic integration of the human being. Art, music, literature become in simple symbolic means by means of which we can interpret other deeper and less explainable instincts within human consciousness. We know that in music uh, we have persons of various appreciations, and appreciation itself is a recognition of value. To appreciate, we must have certain capacities. We must have certain knowledge or familiarity. We appreciate the work of a great conductor because we are aware of the nature of the task which he is undertaking and we know to a measure how it should be done. We may not be able to do it, but we know whether or not he is doing it well. Thus, appreciation becomes a very advanced science in itself. Appreciation is really almost as difficult as the actual performance of an art. To really appreciate, we must be profoundly wise. We must have a great internal value dimension upon which we can call for uh, judgment in time of determination or decision. Man has looked for value in many ways. A 
and perhaps one of the most important considerations in religion and philosophy is the effort to determine that which is most valuable of all things, or certainly a group of extraordinary values, which may be regarded as superior to lesser values. What is the most valuable thing in the world? was once asked by a king of Crete, and a Grecian philosopher replied, Truth. Truth is the most valuable of all things. Yet in this search for value, there is nothing more difficult to determine than truth. Truth is something uh, which can appear to be immediately available. Yet the more we consider it, the more we ponder it, the more abstract it becomes. But also we realize that truth is very important to us. There is an old saying, or an old story, in some of the legends of the ancient Jewish peoples about King Solomon and how on occasion God came to him and said that he would grant to Solomon anything in the world that he wanted. And Solomon, after a little thought, said to the Lord, Give me wisdom. Because if you give me wisdom, anything else in the world that I want, I can gain for myself. It becomes the universal key uh, to all other value. Therefore, if truth per se is the ultimate value, then wisdom is the most valuable way or the most valuable instrument by which the individual may be able to come to the apperception of that which is true. So to most ancient peoples, wisdom was regarded as a great value, something to be earnestly sought after, something to which we might pray for which we might pray to deity that it would be bestowed upon us. Yet wisdom as value is in itself a very interesting thing, because wisdom does not descend miraculously upon the foolish. The cultivation of wisdom is one of the most arduous of all pursuits. Consequently, there is truth in the universal belief that that which is most valuable is most difficult to secure. That which is most valuable requires the greatest uh, contribution on the part of man. The more valuable the thing, the more difficult it is to attain, and the more the human being must give of himself in order to attain it. Wisdom then being, to a sense at least, uh, the key to all this mystery, we have to think a little bit about wisdom as value. Wisdom is a kind of value which may or may not be obvious or immediate in the experience of the individual. Wisdom may or may not cause the person to be rich, powerful, influential. It may or may not give him a life of ease or security. Very often wisdom tears the individual from all his footings and makes him a wanderer upon the face of the earth. Very often wisdom causes him to turn his back upon those things most prized by other men, to search alone and in solitude for things which others have rejected or not found valuable. Wisdom may keep a man poor, or it may turn him from profit uh, to the unselfish, dedicated service of his fellow man without compensation. So wisdom does not immediately solve the problem of the average person. Wisdom solves the problem only of the wise man. For when a man is wise, he is pleased with wisdom, and he is happy at the products of wisdom. But if the opinions of the wise or the laws and statutes of the wise are imposed upon those who are not wise, Instead of finding joy, they find misery. Just as the imposition of law and order upon the lawless will bring them little contentment or peace of mind. 
So wisdom becomes a clue to another uh, statement of value, namely that value is closely and intimately associated with the power of the individual to appreciate value. Value must always be something within his comprehension. But the universe is a constant process of unfolding comprehension, so that the standards of value naturally change, and the person gradually increases in his discrimination. And this brings us to the thought of discrimination as value. The power to discriminate between things. The power to determine those things which are most necessary may likewise be regarded as a powerful value. Discrimination, again, arises from the nature of the person himself. Discrimination causes him to choose that which is inevitably satisfactory to himself, or if he has been uh, developing along scientific or, or industrial lines, discrimination causes him to choose such products as seem to be the best value in terms of their economic worth. Always discrimination, however, seeks to divide the lesser from the greater, the real from the unreal, the satisfactory from the unsatisfactory, the good from the less good. And as all these terms are relative, our problem of value goes right back again to our own ability to estimate value. Now man's objective sensory structure is not always, in fact not usually, able to actually estimate value. When we search for things of value, we are searching out of some kind of knowledge which we believe that we possess. Going back to our Chinese story again, we can imagine that a person is wandering among the shops of Canton. He would like very much to bring home with himself some valuable Chinese things. He has some taste. Uh, if the Chinese were asked to describe the taste of the average tourist, uh, I'm afraid, however, it would not be very glowing as a description. Uh, the uh, average tourist in the Chinese thinking, or the Chinese art world, is lovingly referred to as a one-time pigeon. He is the individual who has money enough to buy something and will never be seen again, so you may as well give him anything you think will please him and make as much money as possible. This is the problem of the man wandering the street of Kanba. But he is now focusing all that he knows upon the important problem of trying to outwit a Chinese in his own business, which is not easy. So he says to himself, I'm going, I want to buy some Chinese art. How am I going to tell whether it's good or not? So he calls upon traditional value. He says to himself, if it's old, it's good. Now, we apply that criterion to people, we wouldn't get very far. Because there's no way of proving that a person has become a magnificently valuable thing simply because he has become an antique. So we are not quite sure of this. But the idea in art is that as it gets older, it gets better. But the Chinese gentleman has also played checkers with this situation before and knows exactly what to do. He has taken the most recent things he has, dipped them in coffee and tea, rubbed them, thrown them around the store, and buried them for a couple of weeks. At the end of this time, they are in a pretty badly dilapidated condition. So our individual, who is working from a yardstick of decrepitude, sees this tattered thing and says, Ah, here is value. Here is something that must have actually come from the home of Confucius. Nothing could be as dilapidated as this and be less than a thousand years old. So a very beaming merchant sells it to him at a ridiculously low price and everybody is happy. Happy, of course, unless the buyer sometimes sometime tries to sell his object. Then he discovers that he has something that is entirely worthless. 
but he is not likely to admit this, he will then decide that the new buyer is simply uninformed or attempting to rob him. So the illusion goes on uh, to absurdity. Another traditional value that we have uh, always in uh, the superficial mind is that the more work that there appears to be on a piece of art, uh, the more expensive it should be. The idea being that artists are paid by the hour. Therefore, if we find something that is, a simply, lo that is simply loaded with ornamentation and decoration in the most brilliant colors and in the most terrible confusion, this obviously represents a masterpiece. This is the way we view life. It has nothing that limits it to art. Complexity becomes value to the uninformed. If it is difficult, it is good. It's like the elderly Scottish lady who went to church and heard the sermon. Uh, when she got through, someone asked her what the minister talked about. Oh, she said it was a wonderful sermon, but of course, I didn't understand a word of it. This is the idea. If we don't understand it, it's good. If it is very complicated, it is wise. If it is said in Latin, it is sovereign truth. <laughs> in, in sober fact, uh, it is simply another way of catching the unwary. The person who does not know mistakes the thing for good because it hits him in the face, a terrible blow. And I mean a shuddering blow in some cases. So he thinks he has a treasure because he has something that is very complicated. Another point in the traditional code is that it is more expensive if it is bigger. This is one of the most common situations. If it's six inches high, maybe it's worth ten dollars. If it's ten feet high, it is obviously worth a fortune. What it is seemingly makes very little difference. The uninformed buy by the pound, or by the yard, or by the foot. So the larger it is, the grander it is supposed to be. And many individuals have paid more to freight an object home than it was worth, simply because they bought something that was tremendous at what they regarded to be a very reasonable figure. So size is mistaken for value. Another thing, of course, that is mistaken for value is psychological size. The great professor is regarded as a highly important person, although he may or may not be particularly informed. When a very uh, mediocre citizen becomes alderman, he becomes a gentleman of consequences. He's gotten larger suddenly. Therefore, he is more valuable. No one knows why, and during his term of office, he never does anything valuable. But he is still more valuable because he is an alderman. This again carries on into your art world. A signature, a name, a seal, great value. Of course, it may be forged. It may never have been anywhere near the artist whose name is there. But names become very valuable to people who have more faith than discrimination. Even assuming that the name was genuine, we have no reason to assume that a name or a seal alone is the certainty of excellence. Perhaps it, if it is genuine, it gives us a greater sense of assurance. Antonio Stradivarius made some of the greatest violins the world has ever known. But every violin which he signed is not a great violin. Some are pretty bad. So the name does not necessarily stand for value. But in uh, the shopping world, it becomes a very important symbol. We know this today, where names have become recognized as symbols of integrity. Years ago, they may have been. Today, it is very doubtful if the name has much meaning. But we still follow it because we are leaning on crutches. We want some patent way to determine value without having the skill to discover it for ourselves. So we go along the street of Canton and we look for other ways of determining value. In the search for value, we are often involved in the quest for the bargain. One thing that seems to increase value 
is if there is a possibility that the worth of something is greater than its price. We feel in this way that we have come into the presence of an opportunity, an opportunity to have something that is worth more than we have reasonably paid for it. This is the most terrible snare which has caught not only followers of art, but followers of every line in the world, including modern merchandising, is this desperate search for the bargain and the substitution of the idea of the bargain as a means of getting something of value greater than its cost. The uh, Oriental art merchant is well acquainted with this trick and has lured many persons into buying something that was half price, and which the true value of which was less than half of the price that was finally paid. In, uh, in discrimination, the bargain is of no value in determining whether or not something is suitable to our need or to our purpose. If we are in a situation where economy is extremely vital, then we certainly must make use of every possible uh, opportunity uh, to secure things reasonably. But in terms of value, we seldom get a bargain. We get something that is usable, but not a bargain. So all through the world, this search for value runs against imposture, and it runs against uh, the skill, the almost incredible skill, of those who are attempting uh, to falsely stimulate our avarice or our desires to acquire things. The value is not to be found in this way alone. Now there have been several great artists and art collectors who have sought the value and uh, for a minute I would like to, to pause and give them some consideration because I think uh, that the whimsies of these people are interesting to us. He was a very great collector of Chinese porcelains. This man had one of the finest collections in the world. He spoke no Chinese, and until the very last years of his life, he never went to China. He finally did make one visit. But he had an uncanny ability to know great Chinese art. And some of the finest collections of the world today were built upon the material which he accumulated. This man had the uncanny ability to sense value. Now, this was something that he was born with. He was a collector at a time when great collections of Oriental art were almost unknown out of China. He collected at a time, naturally, when great and fine examples of art went a begging, and he got for a few dollars things that today are worth thousands. But this was not his real genius. His real genius was to step into a situation in which no one cared, and no one seemed to know, and no one seemed to appreciate. And in this situation, to suddenly discover a concept of value which had been ignored, but which enabled him to move into a field in which he was practically alone. Therefore, to do almost exactly as he pleased in this field. He therefore must be regarded as one whose sense of value transcended the traditional and went into a completely neglected area. Uh, most Europeans of his time, and he was European, were much interested in Renaissance and in the early European primitives and the great European masters. And as a result of this interest, the prices of these things were rising as they have continued to rise even now until they became, we might say, the luxuries of the very rich or in our generation are destined almost inevitably for institutions. Private persons can no longer own them. In the midst of this tremendous overemphasis upon European art, uh, this man discovered Asiatic art. He found moving into London and Paris and the great art centers of the world marvelous examples 
of the beautiful paintings, ceramic, silks, jades, and bronzes of China. Uh, he became fascinated with them. He knew they were good. And so, ridiculed by his contemporaries as being the collector of trash, he gradually acquired the great treasures, uh, which uh, up to the time of the recent revolution, the Chinese themselves were trying to get back. He became a tremendous authority because he broke through and discovered meaning. He discovered value. Now, what did he how did he describe his own experience? What did it mean to him as a person? He took a beautiful example of Celadon, Chinese, beautiful Chinese moss green ceramic. And he stood it alongside of some of the elaborate productions of the European uh, porcelain manufacturers and even some of the great historical pieces of early European ceramics. And he said that he discovered in the Chinese pieces something that was lacking in the European art. And this thing that was lacking was this wonderful rightness of things. He suddenly realized that these Chinese masters of art had been moving from a canon of art that was much more rich than that of most of the European masters. He learned, for example, that this great ivory work, this great jade, these marvelous pieces of crystal, these ancient excavated bronzes, came from people who had a great sense of life value. They came from people who worked tremendously from a religious inspiration, and yet their religion was not forever obvious. He looked in the great galleries of Europe, and he found that most of the masters, from Botticelli down to Velasquez, had painted principally Madonnas, or crucifixions. He found the Chinese equally religious, but they did not move into this obvious area of religion. He found in them this marvelous worship of the fitness of things. He found in them a spirituality that expressed itself through an absolute inner certainty of creation of beauty. He knew that these artists must have been great human beings. They had to be. They may have been unschooled. They may have been unlettered. They may have come from a country in political turmoil. They may have been enslaved, but they were still great. They were great because they had the tremendous power to put the thing in the right place. They had the marvelous sense of utter simplicity, which was in violent contrast to the elaborate productions of the Dresden Kilns or the Royal Worcester of England. These things were simply too much. But here in a simple bowl of magnificent design, the mathematics, the geometry, the tremendous structure, the skeletal part of art was there, uh, not adorned, and most adorned by its own simplicity. So he knew that he had something good. He knew that the world would sometime find that it was good, and they did. The world came to know the importance of this type of thing. Another collector who had a great reputation was very peculiar in his own tastes. It is said of him that he never would buy a piece of art that had been excavated from the ground. Now, why he had this peculiar viewpoint, we do not know. It was his taste. It was his sense of value. He also collected Chinese art, but he only collected more recent things. He collected them only because the, that they still had about them the complete meaning which the artist himself had intended. It is the curse of the antique, to this man at least, that it must fade. 
most people today would not recognize the Mona Lisa if they saw it as it was originally painted. It has been overpainted and varnished and restored and repaired. Uh, what we call the mellow color of the old masters is nothing but the gradual changing of the varnish tones from age, in which we see the picture now, as we term it, marvelously mellow, but as, in terms of the original, simply half faded out. This man wanted only that which was in the same condition as was envisioned by the original artist. And in ceramics, he was able to advance this. He was able to secure magnificent examples that appeared as though they were made yesterday and broke all the laws that they should be old in order to be good. Yet many of them were old, but they were perfection in themselves. Because this man wanted the art only in the color, in the form, in the condition in which the artist created it. Now this is a highly technical, highly critical point, but it is still part of the point of value. Another person likes to collect pressed autumn leaves between the pages of a book. The wonderful color of the dried leaf has a fascination of its own, but it can never be actually regarded as the same as the living leaf. Some want the living leaf, some like the pressed leaf between the pages of the book. So there are these different ways in which we approach value. And this value sense certainly does arise from our own psychic integration. It rises from certain polarizations of consciousness uh, which symbolize or set forth our own instincts or the, the peculiar formula of our own individuality. So in our search for what constitutes value, the ageless quest for value, we have to finally go into ourselves and study there, if we can, uh, the laws of this universal mystery. Because it is present in all things. Primitive man sought value just as modern man does. And primitive man, even when he was struggling for survival, produced a great deal of non-surviving factors because he wanted them to be beautiful. He made a spoon in order to dip his soup. A plain, simple, crude spoon would have served his purpose but he couldn't resist the instinct to decorate it. Not because it increased its usefulness, but because in some way it became more pleasing to himself. And this pleasing something that is non-utilitarian, this overtone, in which satisfaction rises above usefulness, has something to do with the rise and origin of the consciousness of value. And in man himself, we have a being with a certain subconscious maturity. I think it is necessary always to agree with the basic premise of Socrates, namely that there is something inside of man, something at the source of himself, which is better than his common knowledge of himself, better than the person he knows is the person in himself whom he does not know. If, therefore, we search deeply enough into man, we will find as we go deeper, more and not less, that man moves from a rich core existence into a diluted circumference existence. That in man there is something that is richer in the knowledge of value than his normal, average, everyday, conscious experience. This other thing which is richer is the thing which value must ultimately cater to, or which must help man to reveal value. So we can, uh, we can apply this in a way to the contemplation of art. Most great art lovers especially lovers of Asiatic or ancient arts, uh, choose their art in a very simple way. They simply sit down and let the art move them. 
they become quiet to the eye. They in some mysterious way relax the artificial criteria of the conscious mind and seek for the subconscious experience of value. If the person ceases to use his mind, ceases to use his emotions, ceases to make use of formulas, gets his eye away entirely from the price tag, and simply relaxes, he really believes and usually can prove that he has a taste inside of himself that is a sure guide to value than any rationalization which he can apply. Consequently, the very process of art knowing is a meditational process. And the entire experience of value is a meditational process. The person cannot depend upon others, cannot depend upon his own experience, and does not dare to depend upon exterior symbols which are deceptive. He can only come to the final conclusion from his own subconscious. And when his subconscious nature, looking at this object or this thing which he is considering, very quietly says to the conscious personality, this I like, the chances are that value has been found. The internal part of man, according to Plato, and he derived it, of course, from Pythagoras, was, in the Greek theory, a kind of living psychic geometrizer. In other words, this internal part of man was a harmonic formula. It was a composition itself, as natural, as perfect, and as inevitable as the balanced pattern of a snowflake. Not only is it true that God geometrizes, but it is true that the human soul is a pattern of absolute order. Therefore, this is a pattern of absolute fitness. And the only part of man best capable of judging value is that part of man which is itself the most valuable. And the soul is by many degrees more valuable than the body. And it is more important to achieve the contentment of the soul than it is to achieve the comfort of the body. And nearly all creative persons or real idealists or constructive individuals have been willing to sacrifice the body for the soul because they have recognized where the true value in living actually exists. So Socrates would more or less take the ground that what we would call acceptance or to like a thing greatly, even perhaps to venerate it, arises from the fact that it satisfies the harmonic structure of our own subconscious. That this harmonic structure is the compendium or the sum of our own psychic growth cannot be doubted. But whereas our psychic growth upon the surface is a series of fragments, in this inner part, this growth has been assimilated into a formula or into an orderly design. And it is from this total formula that the subconscious values or estimates things whereas man estimates only from the superficial appearances and surfaces of things. So the Greeks tell, took the attitude that the only way that we can really intuit value is to become so quiet that we can experience the psychic movement in ourselves. We can sense our own psychic nature either rejoicing or being offended. And finally, if the inner life of the person is offended, he will never be satisfied with the objects. Satisfaction must mean compatibility, and value must always be compatible. 
If we go outside of the problem of arts and matters of that nature in our search of life values, we must then seek again for this compatibility. And I think in this we have another interesting phase of philosophy that touches once more into our Zen department, where some of our primary interest is in connection with this quest for value. In the, in the Zen thinking about things, value uh, takes on the coloring of a Buddhistic kind of experience. And in Buddhism, this value is, uh, perhaps the best way we can say it, is an experience of life value. It is experience of value as something living rather than merely a quality. Uh, value in man is a certain appropriateness in his own nature. This appropriateness in Zen arises from enlightenment. And this enlightenment, in turn, is an extension from within the individual himself of certain Buddhistic principles or concepts. So we have the Zen point here, which I'll try and explain in this way. The Zen masters, in their contemplative disciplines, are seeking, for example, inevitables. They are seeking uh, the coreness or core factor in a thing. So they to gradually take the universe and reduce it from the infinite complexity that we know to an ultimate simplicity. To the Zen, the universe is an extremely simple thing. And they differentiate very clearly between the universe as it is and man creating a whole series of art, sciences, and philosophies and religions in a desperate effort to interpret the universe. The Zen takes for a simple point that the universe will never be solved by interpretation. The universe must be discovered by direct experience alone. Direct experience of a thing is the full knowledge of that thing. And the full knowledge of that thing is its essential nature. The knowledge of a thing is not its age. You do not understand the tree because you count the tree rings. You do not uh, find out value from any contemplation of the historical nature of a subject. Value is the immediate experience of that subject. And value in Zen consists of a series of qualified experiences. Zen can say, from the tree, I secure certain value. The Zen may also say, the tree of its own nature contemplating me, would discover an entirely different value. But in our contemplation, all value discovery has moved in one direction. It has always been man discovering the value in other things. He has never paused even to consider the possibility that other things may be contemplating his values. Uh, this uh, means that as far as Zen is concerned, all value in nature is only man value. A man looking at a tree finds man value in that tree. But if he is very wise, as the Zen would like to hope he can become, man looking at tree can discover tree value. This is the difference. And it's a very abstract point, but it has... Uh, a bearing upon the whole problem of value. Namely, what is the value of a thing of itself, entirely apart from its relationship to man? What is the value of anything if it is divided from man? Does it cease to have value? Would, there, would a painting be valuable if there was no such a thing as man? Would a beautiful ceramic be valuable if there was no such a thing as man? 
Would it be any different whether the bird built its nest in the side of a, of a crag in a rock or built his nest in a magnificent bowl? Would it mean any difference to the bird? Consequently, value in Zen has to be rather carefully thought through because now we come into a consideration of the fact that value is determined entirely upon the structure of the evaluating force or factor. Almost everything that man creates is valuable only to man or valuable only in terms of man. Of course, there are occasionally things which he does which affect other things. But for the most part, a man says this is great because man made it and man appreciates it. Taoism, the Chinese philosophy which gave rise to so much Zen, estimates the value of a sunset. The sunset is important to man because he has a certain kind of nature. Is the sunset important to anything that is not a man? Is the sunset important to a bee or a flower? Is a sunset a miracle to them? Or is a sunset merely something which inevitably takes place around them, of which they may or may not be even aware? So this the search for value for man must be in terms of these things which seem extraordinary, remarkable, wonderful, or uh, unique to man himself. Now, if this is true, what is the value of these things? Man himself will die. Man will pass out of the picture. Time will destroy all of these things which man has fashioned. In a million years, perhaps only a handful will remain to be hidden in some stratification of the rock. Everything that is beautiful that man makes must ultimately fade away. Therefore, where is value in these things? They are not valuable because they will outlast something else. They are not valuable because the substances that they are composed are actually valuable. They are not valuable because they transcend the limitation of human perspective. So the Zen says to himself, under these conditions, how is anything valuable? And the only answer that he can arrive at conclusively to his own meaning or to his own purpose is that value survives the thing which is valuable. Value contributes something to the sum of a condition or state that is growing and unfolding in nature. If every valuable object on the face of the earth today was swept away and not one remained, the sum of value would not be destroyed. Value would continue. Value would remain because Value has contributed constantly to other things. It has contributed continuously to man. Therefore, to destroy the effect of value would have to extinguish man himself. You could not extinguish the things he has and touch value. But if you, distinguish, if you extinguish the man, then you extinguish both himself and the value. But you cannot extinguish man. And this is a point that Zen takes into very definite consideration. Man can die, but he cannot be destroyed. Man can cease to be here, but man cannot cease to be. Man is not created, according to Zen, therefore he cannot perish. He is not destructible, therefore he cannot be destroyed. He cannot be lost, therefore he cannot be found or redeemed. Man remains. Consequently, all value that has meaning must flow in upon man and add to the continuing enrichment of the total stream of man's psychic existence. This is the only thing that value can do to survive. 
value gains its immortality through the survival of the consciousness that is capable of experiencing value. It is true, then, that uh, the great art of the Wei dynasty, 1800 years ago in China, is mostly gone. There are a few examples in great museums. Some of the most famous works of art have vanished away, and some of the greatest painters and sculptors of all time are names only, and not a single surviving work attributed to them is known. Yet although this has occurred, the value of this work has its own immortality, because the value of the unknown artist of Rome was found and lingers in the contribution of culture which Rome has made to all men. The sculptors of Greece may be forgotten, but without them, the philosophy and civilization of Greece could not have changed the course of human history. So value is continually surviving in the total cultural inheritance of mankind. The items may cease entirely, but the value goes on. In the same way, the individual departing from this world in the Buddhist concept may take with him only certain appreciations, certain conscious experiences which he has known within himself. Among these conscious experiences is the experience of value. In this case, perhaps, the experience of value as beauty, uh, the experience of value as friendship, the experience of value as faith. But these values experienced go on. The faithful friend also dies, but faithful friendship lives on. Everything that outwardly contributes to value perishes, but that which it has contributed to in man does not perish. So gradually, all value moves into the psychic life of the person to become the final enrichment of his own soul. And the soul of man, having moved through the ages from the dawn of things, has become the total custodian of all value of all time. So one way in which the ancients symbolized the human soul is that it was the vessel of value. And out of value has come morality, ethics, conviction, culture. Has come religion as we know it, art, music, literature, and even to a certain degree, industry, arts and crafts as we know them today. The great building that rises as a magnificent example of architecture is an embodiment of the entire motion of human value. The person growing day by day in his own understanding, moving along the course between ignorance and wisdom, even in the course of one simple lifetime, is moving continuously through a chemistry of value which he inherits, which has come to him, which is innate to him. Value which influences everything that he sees and everything that he touches. And this value is the legacy of all good. Just as knowledge has been built upon the most primitive foundations, and the first thoughts of man have made possible the present thinking of man, the first simple device lies behind every, every invention, every creativity of human consciousness. So behind man's resolution to become better, to grow, to unfold the natural potentials of his own entity. Behind this pressure is value. Value moving him into the gradual fulfillment of itself. And into this, as the Zen points out, has moved the entire heritage of the race. Now, to some persons, value 
in the term of this great inheritance is more locked than it is in other persons. But it is also true that it is this compound value, this flowing of all streams into each of us, a mystery in itself, yet one that we cannot deny because we can experience it daily. This flowing of all streams into each, uh, which we recognize as culture, as the growing up of values in our way of life. This peculiar and mysterious experience is the reason why each of us has locked in his own subconscious a criterion of value that is greater than he knows. For in him, all things that were valuable have a continuance. Uh, things that are valuable are ideas, convictions, creativities of one kind or another. And they are all locked there. Locked there out of the long pattern of our experience. For example, let us imagine that in middle life, we come suddenly to the remembrance that when we were much younger, something of great beauty, meaning, or significance occurred. At the time of its occurrence, we did not recognize it as value. We tossed it aside, but we did not forget. And much later, when the circumstances of living created in us new needs, this experience which we had previously known became meaningful and perhaps became a directive in an emergency long after we would normally have considered it meaningless. In the same way, out of the pressure of some need that can arise out of the psychic life of man, the entire story of his search for value, just as surely locked within himself as anything else that he can inherit. We wonder how it is possible for the child uh, to gradually develop the facial characteristics of a parent or a grandparent or a great-grandparent, finding it hard to understand how this pattern can be transmitted uh, through the simple processes of generation in which no evidence of the pattern is immediately visible. There seems to be no way of explaining how or why a child should be born in this world with hair of the same color or texture as a remote ancestor. Why is this and how does it happen? The Mendelian law is a simple statement, but it still is not an explanation. It does not reveal to us the full machinery that makes this possible. But if it is so possible that we may transmit almost any type of physical characteristic it is also possible that we may transmit psychic characteristics. We know that the worrier may come from a family of worriers. We know that selfishness is intensified in families and may therefore become an outstanding deficiency of character for several generations. But there is more to it even than this. We may inherit with the great traditional stream of our life the culture of our life the values which have dominated the concepts of all who have gone before us. But there is also this Zen inheritance from self, the inheritance from our own previousness, the inheritance from the lives that have preceded this one in the unfolding of our own experience. If we have lived as conscious beings through all of the experience of history, we have lived through every level of value. And this value has been gradually stored within ourselves, not as a series of details so that we can come back or bring back into our mind the formation of a Persian helmet or an ancient Etruscan plate, but the senseness of good, the senseness of fitness, the recognition that in those days Great art was produced, great philosophy was conceived, great religion was written. When we recognize 
that the Psalms of David, among the greatest of religious poems, have come down through over 25 centuries, we know that there was great understanding long ago. And this idea that no one has had any intelligence until the 20th century is quite false. And if there's any doubt about that, the 20th century itself is removing the doubt. <laughs> Actually, we have received a tremendous heritage of sensitivity. There is a strange refinement that has come to us because we have grown up with the experience of value. We have known in our own background, in the mystery of ourselves, the sacrifice that men have made to give beauty to the world. Perhaps at some other time we ourselves have been part of that group that sacrificed so much. We know those who have died in order that men might live better, that have given themselves and all that they are to the dream of world peace, or to the brotherhood of man, or to the release of humanity from slavery. These great idealists of the past were serving value. What they went through, we have also shared in. Uh, we were at one time their contemporaries. Perhaps we were their very selves. But little by little, the whole concept of world value has moved in upon ourselves to become the basis of certain longings, certain strivings, certain desires, which are very difficult for us to put into words, but are the continuing expression of the growing conviction of that which is right, or the fitness of things moving within our own natures. We can see a phase of this in our world today. We can see the struggle that is now going on to preserve what we regard as a fitness and that is the rights of peoples, the right of people to self-government, the rights of people to freedom and liberty and education and these things, all represent values which we believe to be real. And we believe these values because we have them in ourselves. We neglect them. We may deny them by any specific action of ourselves. We may be unwilling to sustain them, support them, or defend them, but we have them. And when we go against them in some way, we become less than ourselves. When we go against them, we lose respect for our own natures. And we must seek in forgetfulness and escape from that which we are afraid to remember. Thus value also gives us the concept of things uh, that may be. Now, in the, in the whole concept of life as we know it, man is the only creature that has two propensities within his own nature, as far as we know. Man is the only living thing that knows that he is going to die. All things will die, but man is the only one who knows this. We have no way of sensing that animals are burdened throughout their lives by any fear of death. We know that they are going to die and that they are going to meet it in one of many forms. But there is nothing to indicate that they know it. So that perhaps they are saved of the tremendous neurosis which burdens man and has made him one of the most difficult creatures in the world to live with for himself as well as for all, all other creatures. The second thing that man possesses is that he is the only being that we know of who has the power to envision a state in the future better than it is now. He is the only creature that recognizes itself as an architect of destiny. He is the only creature that in a state of war can still dream of peace. He is the only creature that in a state of intense competitiveness, such as we know today, can still envision a utopian world of cooperation. Man, therefore, possesses the the incredible capacity to dream of a way of life that is the fulfillment of something better than his conduct today makes possible. Here again we come into uh, Zen and higher Buddhist metaphysics because actually man's power 
to dream that he is better than he can be in action actually means that he is already better. Man cannot dream of anything that has not already been attained by himself. Therefore, actually, if man can say honestly to himself, I would really like to live in a world of peace and beauty and harmony and security and friendship and love. If a man can say this and mean it and experience the need for this in his own consciousness, then that man has already attained that. Only he doesn't know it. Between this internal attainment and his external state remains the problem of his own personality. But he now has a personality that is in conflict with his own principles. This conflict we recognize everywhere. And one of the byproducts of such conflict is psychic illness. Psychic illness arises from the fact that man is growing up mysteriously in his own psychic life and his material life is not keeping up with it. Now this would be almost the exact opposite of what we generally think. We say to ourselves man's material progress has greatly outstripped his cultural and therefore we are in serious trouble. This is not the real principle, but of course it is the apparent principle. The apparent principle is that our physical progress has gone more rapidly than our morality. But both the physical progress and the morality are on the objective plane. Therefore, man has made inventiveness advance more rapidly than his ability to release his own value. This does not mean, however, that his value is not there. It does not mean that man's scientific knowledge has actually excelled his spiritual knowledge. It means that his scientific way of life has excelled his ability to use his spiritual knowledge or to be aware of his own psychic uh, integrity or intensity. <coughs> Thus we are confronted with the fact that man has within himself the great vision that has given him religion, given him art, music, and all of these tremendous cultural things. But he is unable uh, to live personally in a manner consistent with the best of himself. He lives by a compromise. And the more complete the compromise, the worse his material affairs must go. So we have a person whose internal psychic nature knows that that person is immortal. Yet that person himself is a materialist who has no belief in survival after death. Well, this is a curious situation. The only way in which materialism can be sustained is by carefully avoiding the recognition of the internal intensity or the internal pressure of consciousness. To meet this, the individual tries to explain away his own psychic entity. He tries to say to himself, I believe that I am immortal. I instinctively believe this. I can't help it. I, I noticed some time ago quite a, an interesting dissertation by Sigmund Freud in which he was fighting and wrestling with the angels about the problem of immortality. Freud said in one of his books, I want to believe in immortality. I want desperately to believe in it, but I can't. I simply cannot fit it into my concept of the way the universe actually is. So here is a man who has within himself immortality, who can't die if he wants to, and yet is afraid to believe that he is immortal. He is afraid because it conflicts with the structure of his own mind. This is a good example of what Zen tries to reach out and correct, and that is this dominance of the intellect over instinct. This instinct 
in Freud which made him say, I want to believe. This instinct within Dr. Einstein which caused the same confusion. This instinct to these men was merely a residual traditional superstition. To these men it was merely the continuance of a kind of folk belief. They could not realize that this instinct was themselves. They had to explain it away because they had to retain the materialism which came to them to be regarded as the symbol of intellectual maturity. But the Buddhist, particularly the Zen, say very simply that uh, if we are quiet like children, we will strangely move into the kind of world that children live in. We will move into a world of beautiful believing. We will move into a world in which our own attitude changes everything. There's a wonderful fable about this in the Buddhist doctrine, which I think is, is rather, rather to the point. Uh, the Buddhist tells us, for example, particularly the Zen sect, that the mysterious fabled otherworldness, uh, the golden shores of Sukravati's blessed land, is not remote, it is here. Uh, certain Christian mystics have held the same attitude, namely that heaven is here, only we don't know it. Baby more or less held that view. So did Meister Eckhart. Heaven is here, but we don't know it. And the Zen says, if you will look at a tree from the outside, with ordinary eyes, you will see what you see. If, however, you look at a tree from inside yourself with the Zen eye, this tree suddenly becomes the jewel tree of the ancient sutras. This tree suddenly blazes forth into the magnificence of a divine being because that being is there. This tree suddenly becomes radiant. The earth becomes radiant. All living things seem to be moved in tremendous fields of light and energy. Man looking from within himself sees the universe of the withinness of value. And suddenly as he looks, the universe of tired, weary things, the universe of death and pain, suddenly seems to fade away. And the light in himself, touching all these things, transforms this world into the most glorious paradise conceivable. Suddenly this world is heaven. Everything in it is magnificent, beautiful, inevitable, eternal. And then in the moment, as in the case of Plotinus, the heavens close again. And man is back again into his own small fault-finding sphere of personality. He cannot hold this, not as yet. But if he was able uh, to go to the inward dimension of life, he would find that he is in the same wonderland uh, that makes beautiful the lives of children. Children have not learned to forget beauty. Men have not yet learned to remember it again. So in the forgetting and in the not remembering, we live in a dark world. But this darkness is in us, not in the world. It is our own inability to experience the release of the power of value within ourselves. The most valuable thing for us, then, is this power to release value. For it is the only solutional thing that we have. And, the, and this release of value gives us the nearest of truth that we will probably ever be able to know or appreciate. Perhaps all that we will ever need to know. For truth for our kind of creature is fulfilled in the realization of the inevitable and immediate nobility of that creature.
Truth for man is for him to realize that he is a radiant truth being. Consequently, uh, in the Buddhist philosophy, particularly uh, the uh, Jodo sect, uh, we learn that the Amitabha concept in which this magnificent being, seated forever upon the open petals of the golden lotus of the sky, with its radiance extending through ten myriads of worlds, its benevolence touching into every part of existence, this being that to our Western minds is little better than a, uh, is little less than a god if we are interested in the concept at all. Certainly this being that seems to possess every attribute of a divinity, suitable for worship and veneration. Yet to the Amidist, this great concept of Amitabha is not a god at all. It is simply man come of age. It is what man is. Instead of viewing this as some wonderful, mysterious power that could only come from a being infinitely greater than man, therefore requiring a vast concept of theistic forces operating in nature, Amitabha, the all-compassionate, the perfectly enlightened, the Lord of life and death, the infinite servant of all that lives, who has planned in its own consciousness not only the salvation of man, but the salvation of every blade of grass, that it not only is the illumined Buddha of mortals, but is also the perfection of the lotus and the star, the perfection of the bird, the perfection of everything. For into this great concept flows everything that lives, for in Buddhism there is no heaven just for men. There is only growth for all things. Yet this concept of this supreme, unselfish being that can never rest, never sleep, and never find peace until the least of all living things, each grain of sand, each moat floating in the sunbeam, has become in its turn a fully enlightened Buddha. This being is not a god. It is merely the goodness in man himself. It is the thing that man would want. It is the thing that man is. It is the growing up and maturing of the father and the mother sacrificing for their child. It is the growing up and maturing of great dedicated human beings, world teachers, who have died at the stake or on the cross for man. It is simply the tremendous fact that inside of man is a being so infinite in value that we hardly dare uh, to speculate about it. Yet it is this humanity which is growing up within the person. And it is the recognition of this and the cultivation of this power which to the Eastern mind constitutes value. Therefore, the, the most noble value in all the world is the realization of our inevitable opportunity and obligation to grow. The only thing valuable really to man is his growth toward the fulfillment of his own destiny. Not because this destiny is a selfish achievement, but because this destiny is part of the inevitable process necessary to the fulfillment of all things for all creatures everywhere. In the Buddhist canon, consequently, we do have this feeling of value. We have the value of the realization that the search for value is forever the dedication of self to the mystery that is locked within the mortal structure of man. 
This dedication to mystery may express itself as, di as discipline, as the continuing remembrance of the law in action. To uh, sense this and to achieve it was one of the great principles of Zen doctrine. And I think this principle lingers on in many other religions of the world to become a very forceful element. Today we are searching for peace. Perhaps more than ever before, peace seems valuable to us. We would mostly sacrifice many things we have today if we knew that we would never again be faced with the danger of nuclear warfare. If we knew today that we could, by the surrender of material things, in great measure, if by the giving up of much of what we have, or most of what we have, we could end the danger of war, I think most persons would make that sacrifice. Because it has come too close to us now, this danger of the thing which is not valuable. And suddenly out of all of this dilemma appears the value of something we have neglected, the value of peace. Now peace or concord among nations is merely an extension of the peace principle as it exists within ourselves. We can never have peace in the world unless there is peace in man. And of course we mean in this sense essentially uh, what we must mean, namely that we are referring to lack of peace between men. War is a human phenomena as far as man is concerned. There is strife in other parts of nature that we know. But the peculiar war that we fear most, the unreasonable and uncertain war, is the result of man's own conspiracy against man. And this is the thing uh, for which we seek a solution. And we dream of the possibility of peace. We dream it because we know it. We dream it because every one of us at some time or other has experienced inward peace. We know it because some way we value it, even though it is not commonly attained by us or commonly available to us. So peace becomes value especially when there seems to be great danger that it may be lost to us. Peace is more, however, than the end of war. Uh, peace is the end of fear in man, for without peace, fear cannot end. And with peace, all uh, fears can naturally be sublimated. But even here, we have another value which intrudes itself strongly into our pattern, and that is the value of faith. Faith is something which we have discovered to be a strangely magical agent. So if we have to, to search for something that helps us with value, we can think of faith. Now man could not have faith unless man was man. Man could not have faith unless for millions of years man had been growing up in a world in which certain mental phenomena constantly occurred. Man could not have faith unless he was the peculiar creature that he is. And faith such as man possesses is not possible to any other creature. But this does not mean that other creatures do not have faith of their own. But the peculiar faith that we have is a faith related to the need and means of our own kind. Man is the only creature that we know of that is capable of the full conscious experience of faith in self. Other creatures have faith in man, but man alone seemingly has faith in himself. The faith in himself is born of the fact that internally he knows the strength that is at the root and core of his own being. Man is capable, therefore, of a direct act of faith, because man knows that what we call faith is a believing in something that inwardly that man already knows 
Believing is therefore, or faith is a clarifying toward the conscious recognition of that which is already known. Faith is not an imaginary make-believing thing. Faith is merely the final evidence of the fact already realized. Man has the power of faith because man already has that which will sustain faith. Faith, however, becomes an open way by which the individual trusts himself to the full meaning of his own internal strength. By faith, man can step out into the unknown, not just simply because he has faith, but because in man there is the strength to do this thing. Faith, therefore, releases the strength that is, although for most people it is a substitute for strength, or is something in which we are taking a long chance sustained only by some exterior belief or some conviction. But actually, faith that tells the man that he can do wonders is only telling him the fact about himself. But we do not know this because, again, we are locked from the very substance of our own believing. So faith gives us certain positive attitudes. Faith is value, then, and fear is lack of value. Faith as value supports resolution to use internal potential. And we know time and time again how this operates, how it moves in life. We have a popular saying that has been used in popular metaphysics and popular psychology, uh, for many, many years, namely that the individual can accomplish or be that which he is convinced he can accomplish or be. That if he has the firm and certain realization, he can achieve in accordance with that realization, so long as that realization is reasonable. This simply means in the, in the Eastern philosophy of things that man, by the act of faith, claims his own birthright. Now remember that this act of faith has nothing to do with the fact that he's entitled to a new apartment house or something of that nature. This fact of faith has to do with his power to live according to greater value. Faith, finally, is the conviction that we can be better than we think we can. Faith is not a belief in a situation which will endorse delinquency. Faith is the conviction that there is more inside of man than he has suspected, and that if he, if, if he needs it, if he very simply and naturally asks for it, with the proper attitude of his own consciousness, it will be available to him. But if he asks for it for reasons that are themselves without value, he will move that old law of karma in on himself and wish he had never done it. But faith to the, the Buddhist mystic is just this power to achieve that which is inevitable the achievement of that which is dear and proper. Therefore, faith is the bridge which unites the world of illusion and the world of reality. And across this bridge built of faith, man can move from the appearance of things to the substance of things. And he can also move the inner substance of his nature out into the world of phenomena to direct his action and his conduct in harmony with truth and with principles. So we have in the search for value, the final discovery of value in self. We have the infinite recognition that the great source of all that is necessary to man has to be in man himself. It is the only way in which the entire universal program could be honestly administered. 
Uh, religions in the West say that when man was created, God placed within man a spark of divine power, that God gave a part of himself into the creation of man. By this very concept itself, there is in the root of man a divine power, an omnipotence, an absoluteness, which is, the, is due to the very fact that the God in him is the life in him. And the fact that he is alive is a proof of the presence of the divine principle. In the Eastern philosophies, the presence of this divine principle is somewhat differently interpreted. But the fact remains that they also hold it to be inevitable. That within man is the solution to the mystery of himself. Within man is the means for the achievement of all that is necessary for the well-being of man, individual and collective. And this thing in man is the greatest value that man possesses. It is this thing which is truly his pearl of great price. It is this which is the treasure of his house. And it is this treasure uh, which he is constantly seeking uh, to understand and with which he is desiring to establish a conscious rapport or relationship. Now, if this secret is locked within man, there are many legends and fables as to how it was lured out of its silent cavern. Uh, when uh, the goddess Amiturasu Omikami hid in a cave uh, so that the light of the sun no longer shone upon the world, the other deities contrived a mirror and held it before the mouth of the cave so that the goddess would look in the mirror and see what appeared to be another goddess more beautiful than herself. Because of the jealousy over this other goddess, Amaterasu came out of the cave and light was restored to the world. This is an ancient fable from the Nihonji. But it has to do again with this light that is locked within man and which must be lured forth out of man. And the thing that lures it forth is the reflection of itself. The thing that brings this life out of man is the very reflection of this life in the environment and around man. So that man looking everywhere sees merely himself. And from this position lures out of himself more and more of his own need to solve the mystery of himself. The legends are repeated in many parts of the world, uh, but the stories are so familiar that most of you know many of these fairy tales and legends that deal with this theme. Actually, therefore, the bringing forth of value out of the individual is the luring of this other selfness out of the dark cavern. Now there are many ways in which Zen and other doctrines have sought to accomplish most directly uh, this procedure. But they all point out the very definite fact that all growth, even the luring of this value from within ourselves, must be subject to universal law. Law measures the means of things, the durations of things and the rightness of things in time and under circumstances. Therefore, Zen, nor any other philosophy, can never break law, and can never cause that to occur which is not timely, or cannot bring about that which is not merited or deserved in the situation that exists. So Zen cannot say that there is some trick, or there is some secret formula, or there is some magical means by which, by which man, unworthy of greater light, can receive it. Uh, religion is not sorcery, neither is philosophy. Consequently, the achievement must be lawful. But the achievement can be lawful, for the very simple reason that man's benightedness is the result of the operation of a law a law which causes man to reap as he sows. And if he continues to sow in darkness, he will reap in darkness. 
But Zen points out that this law is always subject to one thing, and that is that all of the thoughts, emotions, and actions of man are subject to the laws of existence. But the laws of existence themselves are subject to the infinite fact of consciousness. Therefore, consciousness never breaks a law. Consciousness is not greater than law. But consciousness is the means for the inevitable and eternal fulfillment of law. Consequently, if man, by a new statement of his own inner understanding of value, a soul states that he causes consciousness to move in terms of value, then man outgrows certain limitations or ceases to keep the causes of his own tragedy moving or circling upon the wheel of destiny. Now the, uh, the answer to this consciousness problem to the Zen monk and to most Buddhist systems is the complete renunciation of false value, not by a long and arduous procedure, but by a process which Zen calls realization. And realization is the simple fact of man's intensive awakening to value. This is itself a psychological process, by the way, because the change has to occur in the psyche. That is the reason why no amount of mental attitude can work this miracle. No amount of affirmation can accomplish it. No amount of pretense or declaration can accomplish it. Because the only thing that can change man is that man changes himself. Now, we can claim anything we want to and remain the same. We can be engaged in the most learned discourse and be just as foolish as we ever were as far as circumstances within the psyche are concerned. If man, claiming much, experiences nothing of what he claims, then his psyche receives the experience of passing through this great claiming and no experience. It remains just as it is. Man inwardly is no uh, more able uh, to use certain declarations than man is outwardly able to use them. And Zen tells us that there is no change by claiming change. An individual does not become spiritual because he changes his creed. He does not become enlightened because he goes to a better church. He does not uh, actually experience this psychic release because he devotes his entire life to reading noble books on great religions and philosophies. These things can never vitalize until they cause an experience of consciousness, a change in man himself. This is why the true person, the person who really believes, is supported by his belief, and why the person who does not really believe, though making great pretension, is not supported by his beliefs. It is only when this betterness becomes the fact of life, and not a theory held in the mind, that we have action. Consequently, Devotion to a principle, no matter how noble this principle may be, has little effect if the individual who is dedicated to the principle is still the same selfish, egocentric person he was before. All of his pretenses, all of his statements have no value. The only thing that has value is the change in himself. So in Zen and in all these other uh, mystical philosophies. Everything depends upon 
the actual experience of direct acceptance of reality. This is value. This is the value that becomes so real that it is centered as fact in the subconscious. When a value is established clearly and firmly in the subconscious because it has received the total acceptance of the mental emotional complex is moved into the psychic nature as a fact, sustained by the continual repetition of the performance of that principle. When this is achieved, then the individual, when he relaxes, when he is under tension, whether, whenever it becomes necessary for him to call upon internal support, all this individual has to do is relax, because immediately the fact which he has set up in himself moves out and gives him the strength that he needs for the circumstances that confront him. But unless this fact is established by intent, unless this fact has automatically taken precedence over the numerous non-factual attitudes, if this fact is not clear enough or strong enough to make a deep impression upon the subconscious, then nothing has been achieved. A person by a series of negative attitudes over 40 or 50 years, by the constant statement of things which are not true, can develop a psychosis. He cuts a deep rut in his own psychic nature, and this becomes the basis of a series of powerful negative situations. The Buddhist says that by continually, over a period of time, reaffirming as fact, experiencing as fact, accepting whole solely and living accordingly, a, a concept of value can be impressed upon the subconscious until this value pattern becomes automatic and subjectively solid. From that time on, this value is available. From that time on, the individual will instinctively live, act, and think in accordance with that value. And if this value is true, if he has built a real foundation of concept, of principles and law within himself, in any emergency that arises, he is sufficient to his own need. But unless the intensity of his own original attitude has cut this deep and clear mark, then it is not available to him. So in emergencies, the person who's had nice thoughts but never really done anything about them does not have strength. But the person who has convictions and has built them quietly and firmly over a period of time, finds these convictions suddenly come out again through himself in the form of his spiritual help in time of trouble. So whatever he has put in there will come out. Also, it is more than just simply this, because if what he puts in is true, then it finally identifies itself with this subjective record of truth which man does contain and gradually helps him to build the total power of the internal over the external. And the more he builds of this internal fact, the more available the eternal fact becomes. So gradually he builds bridges between his personality and the great psychic strength which is within himself. And as this unfolds, he becomes increasingly aware of the Buddha power in himself until finally, in the concept of the Western paradise, man suddenly beholds inwardly the entire radiance of Amitabha. And this radiance is his own eternal nature. 
It is the fact that he has suddenly transformed his world into a paradisical sphere. He has redeemed the situation of his own life. He has discovered value and allowed value to become the true and absolute ruler of destiny. In so doing, he has created his own paradise. And the collective body of mankind, by the same procedure, finally creates the perfect civilization, the ultimate world in which truth rules and all men live together in peace. This is the, the search and the solution to the essential principle of value. And so we'll have to discontinue now and continue next week again. And we thank you all for being here.